All right, um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm Thomas Zimmerman. For those of you who have not met, I'm the Programs Director here at the Pacific Council. Um, and I'm incredibly excited to welcome you all to the first of our Edgerston series events on a rising China uh, here in a virtual format. Uh, for those of you who've joined us uh, for one of our in-person discussions in the past, we try to look at some of the greatest challenges facing the United States relationship with Beijing today, and then explore how we should respond to them. So we are very excited to be hosting roughly one such discussion per month for the remainder of the year. And uh, with the support of the Edgerton Foundation, we're gonna be opening these conversations to a broader public. So please keep your eye out for announcements about our August event. Uh, and feel free to invite anyone you think might be interested in the conversation, because Lord knows we're not going to run out of things to talk about at this point. And with that, I wanted to turn the conversation over to our speakers for today's conversation on the anniversary of the Hong Kong handover uh, and what the future holds for the territory, um, something that is evolving in real time. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand the conversation over to our moderator, Dr. Ira Kassoff. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Uh, and welcome to the Pacific Council's webcast on the 23rd anniversary of the handover of Hong Kong to China, or the return to Chinese sovereignty, whichever you prefer, uh, and the future of Hong Kong. Um, as you just heard, my name is Ira Kassoff. I'm a longtime Asia hand, and for 22 years, I was a diplomat and US government official serving in multiple posts in Asia, including Hong Kong, uh, and then serving as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Asia under Presidents Bush and Obama. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be the moderator of today's discussion, which, as you heard, is a uh, part of the Edgerton series on responding to a rising China. Uh, we're delighted to have two outstanding panelists for today's discussion. Joanna Chu is a Vancouver-based journalist for the Toronto Star, Canada's largest newspaper. Her specialty is China-Canada relations, and she has been tracking global support and solidarity actions in support of Hong Kong's democracy movement. Joanna was previously a Beijing-based correspondent for Agence France Presse, covering China's human rights, legal issues, and social affairs. She's also served as China and Mongolia correspondent for German news agency DPA. And in Hong Kong, she reported for the South China Morning Post, The Economist, and the AP. She covered Hong Kong's umbrella movement extensively for international media. She's also the founder and chair of the New Voices Editorial Collective. I have to work on my pronunciation there which celebrates the diverse creative work of self-identified women working on the subject of China. Jeffrey Wasserstrom grew up in Santa Monica and got his BA at Santa Cruz, his MA at Harvard, and his PhD at Berkeley. He started his teaching career at the University of Kentucky and Indiana University before returning to Southern California to join the faculty at UC Irvine. He is now Chancellor's Professor of History at UCI, where he also holds a courtesy appointment in law and literary journalism. He's the author of Vigil, Hong Kong on the Brink, as well as five previous books, including the 2018 third edition of China in the 21st Century, What Everyone Needs to Know. He has been traveling to East Asia regularly since 1986. He is an advisor to the Hong Kong International Literary Festival, a former member of the board of directors of the National Committee on US-China Relations, and he is a frequent contributor to newspapers such as Wall Street Journal and LA Times and magazines such as The Atlantic and Time. So before we begin, a quick note for our audience, you'll be muted uh, and your video will be off during the, uh, during the discussion, but we encourage you to participate by clicking on the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to send in your questions. We'll get to those questions after the initial discussion, but you can submit your questions at any point during the discussion. So let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, in order to provide some context for today's discussion, I'd like to ask each of our panelists to talk a bit about their connections to Hong Kong. So Joanna, perhaps you could kick it off. Yeah, sure. Thanks for putting on this event and moderating. Um, so I was born in Hong Kong um, in 88. And as all of you know, a year later, uh, the Tiananmen Square massacre happened in Beijing. And actually, there it wasn't only in Beijing. There was a series of protests for more democracy and reform across mainland China, including Hong Kong. So I was actually just a baby when my parents brought me to one of such solidarity marches in Hong Kong, million or so on the streets in Hong Kong. So Hong Kong for a long time has always been a place of kind of defiant protests and a place on Chinese soil where people felt free to be more open and critical um, about the Chinese government. 
Um, at the time, it was a British colony. But uh, looking ahead to 97, a lot of Hong Kongers were getting nervous, including my family. Um, so hundreds of thousands actually immigrated away or left Hong Kong, found jobs or study abroad opportunities away from the city before 97 because they knew China was going to take over um, and the legal system and with the massacre fresh on people's minds, um, people worry that the kind of rights and freedoms and rule of law that Hong Kongers got used to would be taken away from them. Um, people thought it would take longer than this. They thought um, Beijing agreed to the Sino-British Declaration, which uh, would allow Hong Kong to retain its high level of autonomy and its legal system for 50 years. But with what happened with national security law is that people felt like that timeline has been brought forward decades. And young people I spoke with in Hong Kong who felt that in their middle age, they would be Chinese citizens. Suddenly, um, as a teenager, they feel like they don't have much of a future to look forward to because they feel they no longer have those freedoms and rights of expression. So today's Canada Day, and it's a day where my neighbors are celebrating on a patio, drinking beer, um, waving the Canadian flag. Um, so it's a sad time for me and many Hong Kongers uh, diaspora around the world because we see uh, almost 400 people were arrested in Hong Kong who defied you know, the risk and protested on July 1st. And the first person who was arrested under the national security law was for waving a Hong Kong, uh, the British Hong Kong flag, which has become a symbol of independence in Hong Kong, which is illegal um, under the national security law and such crimes can carry a sentence of up to life imprisonment. Um, so I wrote a piece in Toronto Star, it was very personal about how I feel like as someone who has worked in Hong Kong, was born there and even when I was growing up in Canada, my family went to Hong Kong almost every year. Um, I feel like the future is uncertain if it's safe for me to go to Hong Kong again um, because the law, it applies to anyone regardless of nationality, even actions you take when like um, you're living abroad. So people in California, if you say something that um, is very critical and seems to go against one of these very vaguely defined um, new crimes in the law, if you travel to Hong Kong or transfer in the airport, uh, you risk uh, getting arrested. So it is a very unprecedented step that was rushed through. This whole law was only introduced last month and only in the last 24 hours, we saw the full, full text. Um, legal scholars weren't able to really delve into it until just recently. Um, so personally, it's something that's hitting a lot of people around the world. It's hitting journalists. Uh, I saw a video yesterday of a journalist filming a crew of medics during at the side of a protest and the police shot a water cannon blast right at him just a few meters away and he was you know crushed to the floor so it does make me wonder because every time i go to hong kong and cover protests i think oh i'll be careful i'm a text reporter i don't need to get right in the middle of things um, but we see police are increasingly targeting journalists and trying to make sure that what's going on isn't being filmed and recorded um, so personally, it's something that I find very concerning. Um, I try to talk to a range of people, different perspectives in Hong Kong, but even people who are frustrated by the ongoing protests, it's been going on for over a year. Um, even people who don't like what the protesters' tactics are, they're not, they don't tend to be happy about the law and where that's going, because they're proud of Hong Kong as a cosmopolitan place where a lot of businesses choose to be based because of the strong legal system. And to them, that's all changing too. Great. Uh, thank you, Joanna, and happy, uh, happy Canada Day. You've touched actually on a lot of the, uh, the topics that I'm uh, hoping we can get into in more detail. So um, Jeff, maybe you can um, give us a brief uh, uh, description of your connections to Hong Kong. Sure, sure. Well, I, um, I go back further in Hong Kong. I, I was in Hong Kong first uh, before, before Joanna was born in 1987, uh, but I don't go back as far into my childhood there. By then I was a graduate student and I was doing research in Shanghai for my dissertation. And so I went to Hong Kong during Lunar New Year as a break from China. And it was very clear that going from Shanghai at that point was a very boring city without a lot to do it's become much more exciting since then. But going to Hong Kong was a way to get to a place with a free press again, um, get to a place where um, there were more 
of the daily life entertainment things that I was used to from the West. So it was a place I'd never been before, but it felt in a certain way like coming back to the world I knew from a very different China. But on the other hand, in Shanghai in 87, it was a place where on campuses, that was a time when the Communist Party was much more liberalizing. It was much more up in the air what kind of country China was going to become. It was post Mao, uh, pre um, the, the tightening that's come in, in recent years. So there was a lot of excitement on campuses and there was a lot of discussion of politics and a lot of discussion like what could the future be like? And there were a lot of, op a lot of idealistic young people talking about the future and there had actually been a protest there in December of 86, right before I went to Hong Kong. So Hong Kong for me was kind of a way of getting away from protests, away from politics, and just focusing on kind of daily life. And over the time I've been going to Asia since then, it's kind of reversed. That now when I go to Shanghai, when I've gone to Shanghai, there isn't a lot of political discussion on campuses, at least not public discussion, but there is a lot in Hong Kong, it has been. When I've been in Shanghai in recent years, I haven't seen protests, but when I've gone to Hong Kong, I have. So that's a real uh, kind of shift. I mean, Joanna covered so much, but I do want to just mention one thing that I thought about um, while she was, she was speaking. It's a little, somewhat personal. It's been on my mind. Um, I mean, the dark side personally is I'm not sure about my own um, ability to go to Hong Kong and speak freely the way I have in the past. This is really unsettling because foreigners can also be subject to the strictures of the new law. So that's something to adjust to. But I was thinking about something else quite personal. Uh, Joanna mentioned being taken to a protest by her parents when she was a baby. So I, I wasn't taken to protests when I was a baby, but I did grow up in LA during the anti-Vietnam War movement. And I went to protests as a, as a young kid with my family. And one of the things I remember, one of my first memories of hearing a musician play was Joan Baez singing anti-war songs. And she was an active uh, presence in the anti-war movement. And I bring her up because one of the most inspiring figures in the Hong Kong protests recently has been a singer called Denise Ho, who is a kind of voice for um, activism within Hong Kong that reminds me in some ways of the role that Joan Baez played in that movement in the US. And Denise Ho, I've just seen a documentary film about her that's being released today, Denise Ho becoming the song. She's very brave. She's very been in the center of things lately. But she too was from a family that left Hong Kong to go to Canada during the lead up to the handover because they were worried about what would happen. And then she later reconnected to Hong Kong. So that's part of the Hong Kong story is people who, and it explains this fierce attachment that people feel toward Hong Kong as such a special place. So she moved back to Hong Kong, became a popular s singer, had a big fan base on the mainland, but then risked losing that fan base by speaking out in favor of the protests once police began using tear gas against protesters. So that's just a little bit uh, of a story. I'm fascinated with music and the role of music in protests, but that's also a way to connecting that kind of in and out of Hong Kong is part of the story. Uh, it's, it's Joanna's story, but it's also one of other people as well. Great, thank you. You know, I've just learned listening to both of you that I have uh, kind of interesting connections to each of you that I didn't know about. I was also in uh, Shanghai in those days. I was in the, I was in the US consulate from uh, 1985 to 87. And I remember very well all the student uh, uh, ferment and everything that was going on. And I was at the big demonstrations in Hong Kong in 89 as well. And I remember those very vividly. So uh, it's quite interesting. But I have to say, uh, I predate both of you by, uh, by quite a bit. I was first in Hong Kong in 1973, actually, uh, when I was studying in Taiwan. I went, went to Hong Kong during, a, uh, during break, and that was still Cultural Revolution Day, so it was a very interesting time in, uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, then I, I visited there many times in the 80s. As I said, I was living in Shanghai and in Beijing. Uh, and then I lived in Hong Kong in the late 80s for a couple of years, so I was there during that demonstration, as I said, uh, during the Tiananmen time. Uh, then I was back in Hong Kong again from 1995 to 2000. I was in the U.S. consulate uh, in Hong Kong. So I was there during the, uh, the handover, as we called it. Uh, and I remember June 30th and July 1st, like it was yesterday, the, the huge dinner uh, uh, officially uh, formalizing the handover from uh, Britain to China. And then uh, Governor Patton, the last colonial governor, and Prince Charles sailing away on the Britannia at midnight 
and then the PLA troops coming in early in the morning on July 1st. It was quite, uh, quite a remarkable time to, uh, to be there. Um, so why don't we start, um, uh, maybe let's talk a little bit more about the big picture and then drill down into specifics as we go. Um, so where are we now, 23 years after the handover? Maybe Jeff, you can talk a little bit about this and maybe you can kind of uh, remind our, uh, our uh, viewers or listeners um, of the original arrangements and commitments, the one country, two systems, the no change for 50 years, all those kinds of, uh, all those kinds of things. And then also uh, maybe either you or Joanna can talk a little bit about uh, what happened in Hong Kong last year and early this year, the events that have in many ways led up to where we are now. Sure, that's great. Um, so in 1984, a deal was struck between uh, Great Britain and um, the Chinese Communist Party that Hong Kong would become part of the People's Republic of China in 1997. Um, 1997 was always the date that was going to um, loom large because parts of Hong Kong became a British colony in uh, the 1840s, another part became in the 1860s when Britain defeated the Qing Empire in two opium wars. But a large part of what is now Hong Kong, the new territories, became part of uh, Great Britain in um, 1898, but it, was, but it was not given to them as a colony, it was a leased territory. There was a 99 year lease. And so in 1997, the, the lease would run out and those parts of uh, Hong Kong would become part of uh, the People's Republic of China. The rest of Hong Kong could have stayed part of Britain, but it depended on the new territories for a lot of the food and water and energy. So the idea was, as long as there could be at least some degree of faith that something, there would be a decent life for the people who were making this transition, um, London was, was willing to agree to give all of Hong Kong back without it being a fight. So this was um, agreed upon in something called the Sino-British uh, Agreement. And then in 1990, it was more formalized what exactly would happen after 1997, the handover date. And the deal was that for 50 years after 1997, under this framework called One Country, Two Systems, Hong Kong would be part of the country of the PRC. And that meant that things like national defense and foreign policy would be handled by Beijing. But there would also be two systems. That's the, the local system would stay in place for 50 years. That would be a different economic system because Hong Kong was a capitalist uh, setting at that point but it would also be a different system of law. Hong Kong had more separation of powers between, it had independent courts, it had more of the rule of law. And so the idea was that this was made in a kind of good faith understanding in the, in the basic law. And it's important to remember, I mean, after the Tiananmen protests and the June 4th massacre of 89, there was a lot of concern about this uh, around the world. How could you really expect a country that had been so repressive toward its own people to respect um, the rights of, of this new city that would become part of it. Um, but Margaret Thatcher was interviewed about this in 1990, and I talked about this in the book, and she said that she was just confident that Beijing would keep its promises. Even there had been the, re the repression, but she said, look, um, Deng Xiaoping is not turning his back on reforms. Um, this is a dark period, There's a, there was a crackdown, but over time, and a lot of people had this faith, over time, China would at least get somewhat more liberal and would become a bit more like Hong Kong at the same time that Hong Kong would become part of, of China. And she also said she had faith because she thought Beijing would keep its promises because Beijing would want to be seen as keeping its promises in, she said, the forum of the world. And this was a time when the Chinese Communist Party wanted to gain acceptance, to be treated as a normal uh, uh, power, wanted, wanted China to be uh, to get to become part of the international order more. And what's amazing is that during the first years after the handover in 97, how much was respected of the kind of two country, uh, two systems part of the deal. Hong Kong did keep being a place where you could have public protests without there being a crackdown. You could apply for the right to march and be given the right to march. Uh, there were some elections, the chief executive, uh, the kind of counterpart to the colonial governor, was not really elected. He, um, he and more recently she 
was elected by a very small group of electors, uh, fewer than 2,000 people in a city of more than 7 million. So it's not anywhere near democratic, and it has to be somebody who Beijing finds acceptable. But there are other elections that, that affect sort of lower level officials in there. So from 1997 until about um, 10 years ago or so, it was extraordinary how well this experiment, which was not like anything that had happened in a Communist Party state before, was working. The press could still criticize the local authorities. It could even criticize uh, the authorities in Beijing. Um, but then over the last decade or so, as in part, um, the Chinese Communist Party has become um, more self-confident and more um, and tightening controls within its own, uh, within the mainland and exerting more repression in Xinjiang and Tibet, places like that. As part of that whole pattern, there's been an effort to try to tighten the controls on Hong Kong and make Hong Kong less different uh, as a city. And there have been protests to push back against that. So there have been a whole series of protests from 2012. There were big protests against bringing mainland style uh, patriotic education into Hong Kong and that pushed back against it. There have been big protests back in 2003 against efforts to, bring to come up with rules about sedition uh, security laws. In 2014, there were big protests to try to get more democratic elections in Hong Kong, to try to make it be a true dem democratic election of who was chief executive. And um, that was the umbrella movement, uh, a famous moment. And then last year, there were the biggest protests of all, which were pushed back against a proposed extradition bill, which would have made it possible for Beijing to take people they, they wanted to have punished over onto the mainland and subject the people to mainland um, courts and justice system that's much more rigged. So in a way, what we saw, we've seen for the last, um, the last five years or so, a series of efforts by Beijing to insert more control over this, um, this, this city. People have said one country, two systems started to become one country, 1.8 systems, then 1.5 <laughs> systems, 1.3 systems. If the extradition bill came through, it would have been 1.2 systems. And now in a sense, what we've seen with the national security law is it's really um, one country, one system. With some differences, admittedly, maybe a different economic system, but increasingly the difference in sort of politics, civil society, freedom of speech are largely uh, disappearing. Thank you. Yeah, numerology has always been very big in Chinese history. You know, I have, um, this kind of off the wall view of the no change for 50 years, which I've never found anyone else uh, agree with, uh, to agree with me on, uh, but I'm gonna throw it out there. Um, Deng Xiaoping said, for those of you who speak Mandarin, he said, Wu Shenian Bu Bian is this kind of throwaway line. And to me, what that means is it won't change for a long time, but because he was at the top, oftentimes, and we see this throughout Chinese history, the emperor makes a kind of a general statement and then it gets interpreted very rigidly by bureaucrats down the line. So that 50 years, which to me meant for a very long time, was immediately interpreted as exactly 50 years. And there were all these groups like the 2047, Better Hong, uh, the 2047 Foundation and all this stuff was established on the basis of this 50 year thing. But to me, it wasn't originally meant as literally 50 years, but anyway, that's uh, that's my that's my own view. So, Joanne, anything you want to add on this topic before we um, move on? Yeah. So, I think Jeff and yourself went through the details in history very comprehensively. Mm -hmm. So, I guess as a journalist here, um, I can provide some of what it felt like on the ground in Hong Kong. Um, so, actually, the national security law, an earlier version, um, the Hong Kong local government tried to push through in two thousand three, but given the really vibrant Hong Kong protest culture, a mass protest at the time succeeded in having the bill shelved and, um, you know, defeated. So people felt like a sense of accomplishment that this wasn't going to happen yet. Um, in recent years, um, the Occupy umbrella movement that Jeff alluded to or referenced, um, it was really a big shift in the protest culture in Hong Kong. It used to be when I first started working at South China Morning Post in 2012, that journalists could predict exactly how a protest would go. You would get the march route ahead of time. You would know exactly where the protests 
would go through. And often it was a very similar route through Wan Chai, ending near the Hong Kong government offices. And we would stage reporters at each section to interview different people, interview shopkeepers looking at it. It was almost formulaic. Um, and of course, police had to approve each one. But the Occupy movement, it was um, inspired by the Occupy Central movement globally. But uh, Hong Kongers kind of focus their demands um, not against Wall Street and capitalism, but towards uh, calling for democracy and universal suffrage. So instead of protesting one day, they camped out for months. They set up camps all over the city and some of the most busiest parts um, had tents, had homework stations, had food stations, medics, recycling. And the world kind of watched in mostly like a positive admiration because it was very peaceful for the most part and uh, protesters picked up the garbage and were very polite. Um, but it was something that seemed to make the Chinese government really worried. Like this isn't business as usual for protests. They're actually disrupting how the city is functioning and attracting at the same time a lot of positive international recognition. It was a huge story that people were fascinated by worldwide. Um, and then last year with the anti-extradition law, it, it evolved in, again. It was no longer occupation because protesters, I think in 2014, realized they didn't achieve much from the occupations and people just ended up getting arrested and cleared out. Um, and it was very exhausting for them. So as Jeff wrote in his book, um, protesters created um, and adopted this philosophy called being water. It had some kind of Taoist references um, where they would respond in real time to what was happening and, and not be rigid and be unpredictable. So I'm in some of these groups, these encrypted apps where thousands sometimes, 50,000 of protesters would be on any given group. So when a protest was happening at any given time, people say, we're going here now, no, we're going here, there's police there. Let's go to the mall, let's go to the MTR station. Um, so it was impossible for anyone to predict where these protesters would end up. Uh, some of them did resort to tactics that I think was born out of desperation from the youth, uh, teenagers especially, who, were, who felt like they had exhausted a lot of their political means to uh, enact change. So they turned to things like, um, like uh, hurting public property, like graffiti. Um, on last year, I was in Hong Kong a day after a group of youth actually broke into the Hong Kong legislature uh, office where the lawmakers make their laws um, without democratic input. So I think at the time I was there in Hong Kong for several weeks last year, there was a sense of kind of depression and desperation among the youth. Um, at the same time as things were getting a lot more heated with police clashing with protesters, people getting hurt, people getting shot, and police officers using live ammunition for the first time, shooting a protester in the chest. Um, young people were committing suicide. It's unknown how many committed suicide. Some left notes saying that it was because of the political situation. Um, so if Beijing was worried about the Occupy movement, I think they became even more worried from the anti-extradition new protest tactics. And uh, a lot of experts think this is why they pushed forward this national security law so quickly because they felt they had to go through extreme measures to shut down the protest, to make it so difficult to protest and be critical um, that people would have to be willing to uh, suffer li life imprisonment. And so it kind of creates a dynamic in Hong Kong, which is what we have in the mainland China right now, where a lot of the activists, the few that are active in mainland China, they kind of see themselves as martyrs and they're going to not see their families, they're going to end up in prison. So when they impose something like that in Hong Kong, it kind of makes a bar very high for someone to decide to speak out. Um, there's already a chill we're seeing in Hong Kong, a main protest group led by a very famous um, student leaders of from several years ago, Joshua Wong, Nathan Law, Agnes Chow, it disbanded this group, the Masisto. So it shows that people are worried um, and that even if you, we see people on the streets right now still in Hong Kong, um, there's definitely a chill effect that this law has created very successfully. Great, thank you. Um, so that actually leads into um, the next thing I wanted to cover and maybe we can just do it briefly. I don't know how much detail is actually available, but I wanted to ask um, um, 
maybe Joanna, you can start about the national security law. Um, how much do we know about it at this point? What, what are the most significant elements of it? And what are the implications? One, one of the things I read is that um, people who call out in Hong Kong for independence, for Taiwan, for Xinjiang, for Tibet can be uh, brought to the mainland and, and uh, prosecuted there. Is that true? And if so, what does that mean for free speech in Hong Kong? Joanna, you want to tackle that or, or, or perhaps? Oh, sure, just quickly. Um, I have spoken with some activists who are supporting from afar in Canada, and they're worried about extradition treaties that different countries have with Hong Kong. Um, so far, this hasn't happened, but they do worry that there could be an avenue now that because the law is so overarching, so it covers actions all over the world, that it could be feasible that China could request Canada to hand over a Hong Kong solidarity activist, for example. And I wrote in the piece in Toronto Story about how a lot of people feel like they're now, now exiles or fugitives from their homeland, their place of birth, because they don't feel safe traveling back. And they might not even feel safe doing a transfer in an airport in a country that has an extradition treaty uh, with China or Hong Kong. Yeah, so there, there, one of the things is we're, we're still waiting. I mean, there now is the law is out and it's, it came out in Chinese and it's been trans, there's, been, there's a translation as well. And it's being picked apart by legal experts. And there's a good um, summary of some things on the NPR website of Main Takes Away that Emily uh, Fang just put up um, with interviewing law professors from around the country and, and other people. Um, there's a lot of vagueness to it, though. There's always a lot of vagueness, and that's actually one of the things that the Communist Party uses to control people. That, um, I mean, the idea of Hong Kong independence or Hong Kong secession is—it's a very—it it has been a very fringe idea. There are very few people. What people have generally been saying is they want the Communist Party to live up to its stated um, uh, promise of a high degree of autonomy within uh, the country. But in the last couple of years, this, the state has been starting to say, well, actually, we're going to consider it uh, going close to um, succession, secession if you just say that you want Hong Kong to have self-determination. They'll sort of change, the, the, the line keeps shifting. And so I think what makes people very nervous is if it becomes, and I think it now is actually that one form of, um, one thing you can be prosecuted for is uh, criticizing the, the law itself. So it's very, very vague. It's clear also that um, symbols, and uh, Joanna made a good point about one of the first, um, or, or the first arrest being about showing a flag. Um, so these kind of symbolic acts, there's also was a, a law put in effect before this, uh, making showing disrespect for the national anthem, something that you could be um, imprisoned for. And I mean, this is something we know about in the United States where we've had a lot of issues, say for taking the knee, the equivalent, there have been terrible consequences economically and things, but it isn't seen as a transgression of the law that could land you in a jail cell. So um, there's, there's a lot to, to worry about. I think what the Chinese Communist Party says is, well, look, every country has these uh, anti-sedition laws uh, of some sort, but the problem is the vagueness of it the lack of legal procedures of it, the fact that you can be taken over to the mainland to be tried for something where there aren't protections uh, for defendants. And we've seen that um, there are very high profile cases, um, including ones that Joanna's written a lot about because it deals with Canada. Um, in Canada, there's um, a high profile um, Chinese citizen who's up for extradition and up for trial, um, Ms. Meng, she can be out on bail. She can have access to lawyers. There are two Canadians who've been um, incarcerated quite clearly as a kind of um, uh, revenge tactic for that. Um, they have no access to legal counsel. They have, um, they have no possibility of being out on, on bail and there's no expectation of anything like a fair trial. So even when there are things that look like you can say, okay, somebody's in jail there, somebody's in jail here. Um, there are real differences about it. And that's why I think this law has such a chilling effect. Yeah. One other thing that struck me is that um, 
the um, Hong Kong government officials have not been involved in this process at all. I, I think I read that the chief executive said she hadn't seen the, uh, the law. Um, and, Hong Kong, and China, Beijing typically in the past has worked with its kind of allies in Hong Kong, the business tycoons and uh, loyalist officials and, uh, and so forth. But this time now they seem to be just doing this on their own and imposing it on Hong Kong. And that's, yeah, that's that is a shift. That's a shift. There was a good piece in the New York Times about that, that bypassing mm -hmm. of that. Um, yeah. One thing I want to make sure is that there are really, it, it deserves mentioning, uh, Joanna talked about her own experience as a journalist. There are very brave journalists on the ground in Hong Kong, uh, very determined ones. Um, a lot of them are um, Hong Kongers. Some of them are people who've been covering it uh, outside. And there's actually a wonderful book out uh, called Aftershock that's a collection of personal essays by some of these um, really intrepid um, journalists talking about how complicated it is to be covering a uh, kind of life or death struggle within a, a city you're part of and you love. So let's, uh, I have uh, quite, quite a few topics, but I don't know we'll be able to get to them all. So let's um, touch briefly on what's actually happening in Hong Kong right now. There have been a lot of reports this morning about um, arrests. Joanna, you mentioned uh, this uh, earlier, I think. Uh, I saw one uh, clip of officers firing pepper balls at protesters in Causeway Bay. Um, Joanna, do you have any uh, sort of uh, current intelligence on what's happening on the ground in Hong Kong right now? Um, nothing that you might, you wouldn't have seen in um, the reports available. Um, I have seen that it's, there's something that really stuck out in my head that police have a new banner now. Uh, in 2014, when I was covering Occupy, they had a banner that said, stand back, we're going to fire pepper spray. And looking back, I was alarmed by that, but almost that seems almost like harmless now. Oh, pepper spray, mm -hmm. only pepper spray. Um, now they have a new banner they showed yesterday, which is purple, and it says, you may be violating uh, national security law. And there's just streams of police, and it looks like they're set out to arrest people. It's not just a law that's kind of there, but it's something that they kind of want to clearly use to shut down the protests. Um, I think a police um, official said, or a Chinese official actually in uh, Beijing said that even criticizing the police could be seen as inciting hatred towards the police, and that could also be um, punishable under the law. So it's really um, something we haven't seen before. Um, a law professor in DC, Donald Clark, um, pointed to another aspect of the law, which is that Beijing has a power to set up its own national security agency in the city, which isn't subject to either Hong Kong laws or Chinese laws. So it's an agency that can function at will, bound by no laws. So that sounds like something straight out of just, like just that, but like it's very concerning. And I think, like you, like I think Jeff said, um, it's hard as a, someone who is part of the city or cares about the city to be covering this because that kind of idea of journalistic objectivity, seeing both sides, it just keeps getting eroded and becoming more impossible when it comes to Hong Kong because the change towards authoritarianism has been so extreme to the point where it really runs against um, universal human rights standards and legal standards. So I think you, that's why you see so many academics, journalists, people actually going beyond like telling different sides to being pretty clear is like what we're seeing now is pretty um, worrying. And it's something that people on the ground there, journalists, researchers are actually really trying to warn people about because um, China's rise um, isn't something that's contained to one city. It's happening all over the world. We have Canadians detained um, actually, one of the Canadians is my friend, Michael Covey, detained in China um, mm -hmm. without many any rights to speak of. So it's something that people are trying to warn the whole world to learn about and care about. Yeah, for people who love Hong Kong, it's hard to watch all of this without having strong feelings. Um, Jeff, um, uh, again, uh, for us old timers, I, I note with some interest that uh, Martin Lee has reemerged. He he uh, he's in his 80s now. He goes back to my time there, but. Uh, he was arrested not too long ago. He's getting criticized by both sides, kind of like uh, like the old days. Uh, what what do you make of that? So I think it's a it. There's a generational split. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of generational differences within the movement. Uh, people who have different uh, different ages have different 
expectations, they have different feelings about how much they feel part of China, whether they had hopes for, whether they looked forward to the handover as an end to British colonialism, as many did, had hopes for it, whether they looked forward to the Olympics in 2008 as a moment of kind of something to take pride in, or if they felt disconnected, they felt that China has always been uh, a kind of conflicting uh, power with it. So this is, there are many different, many differences. There also have been differences of tactics. Those who've been, uh, we see this in, in American movements at different points, of course, uh, divides between people who emphasize nonviolence um, at all costs for, and others who say sometimes you need to have a degree of militancy or the status quo won't pay attention. But sometimes there are certain um, uniting factors. And in Hong Kong, during last year, there was not as much division as the government kept hoping there would be between people, uh, between young people who were getting frustrated and using more militant tactics and older people who were cautioning for more moderation because there was a shared belief that um, the police were responsible for a disproportionate amount of the violence. So even when there were really terrible things done at certain points by protesters, there was still a feeling of um, that there should be support for the young people because on the whole, it was the police that were more um, violent. It's as things get ratcheted up, as um, things get foreclosed, as um, moderate techniques get no purchase, you are almost inevitably going to have more um, efforts to turn to militancy, which then can alienate um, some people, can have some divides, but it's quite extraordinary how much, um, how much uh, ability there has been to, to maintain support across generational lines. And you've had actually older people turning out explicitly self-identifying as older and saying, we, there was a gray, gray haired march, you know, and I can relate to that. <laughs> they, you know, we need to do this. And some, there's been actually some sort of um, self-criticism. Some people have said, if only we'd made more noise when we were younger, maybe these young people who are going to have to live under this more repressive regime wouldn't have had to do what they've been doing. But there will be, there will be divides. I see what going forward, because um, I know we want to get, a, people are always interested in what's going forward. And Hong Kong has so often defied predictions, it's really terrible to, to have to predict. But I do think what we're entering with Hong Kong now with the movement is very much an anti-colonial struggle. Beijing mm -hmm. is acting very much like a colonial power. The not consulting even with local elites was a sign of that, that it was sort of giving up the facade of being a kind of collaborative thing. And in anti-colonial struggles, they tend to last for a long time. They tend to often have at least a wing within them that, um, that is very militant. And that's in part because less militant tactics are foreclosed. There are often events, uh, struggles in which some of the important action takes place out of the area among diaspora groups. And so all of that we've been starting to see with Hong Kong, and it seems to me that this will just exacerbate it. And they can take a very long time. They often seem absolutely impossible to have no chance of winning, and sometimes they do. So I think yeah. there's an awareness of that, and that should be something we kind of keep in mind as we think about this. So that was actually going to be my last uh, subject area, which was uh, what, what do we see going forward? But And let's come back to that. I just want to touch on one more thing quickly, and that's the sort of the international angle. Uh, I'm sure a lot of our, our uh, participants are interested. What, what, what do you, all, you both think that um, the US should do, Canada should do, the UK, who was the other side of the joint declaration, what, what, what should uh, these foreign powers be doing? I'll start. I'll start, and then Joanna, you can. Follow. Sorry, okay. I did. I just gave a quick look at the questions that are coming in uh, that people have been asking, and a lot of them have been asking about that. So this dovetails nicely. Um, the UK does seem to be saying very seriously now about offering um, a path to citizenship, a period of time uh, open. One one question about that is they're offering it particularly to people who have um, who were who were born before 1997 and so have this status that allows them to come uh, to the UK. And so one question is, will this be extended to the young people born after 1997? Uh, and there, I think there'll be pressure to um, have them do that. That's something that the UK can do. And I think the UK should have a 
feeling of special responsibility here. Um, my own feeling is the most important thing for the world to do is make it very clear they're paying attention, to not look away, and absolutely to not, it's, um, the Communist Party has been quite clever recently in trying to, to do things in stages and to do things that aren't so obviously seen, that don't create the iconic photographs that galvanize global opinion. Um, so we shouldn't feel that just if there aren't, um, if there aren't high profile arrests in the next three days, that won't mean that the law doesn't have teeth. It could mean that they're just waiting a little while till that. We, we fell into this trap, I think, last year of people were saying, when, will there be a Tiananmen result? Will there be tanks on the streets? Will there be a massacre? And that, by expecting that, it's made it seem that anything other than that was somehow not that bad when there was a terrible kinds of brutality, including using tear gas inside enclosed places, inside malls, inside subway stations. That's not a normal use of tear gas. But yet, if what you were hearing was, will there be Tiananmen? Will there be Tiananmen? Ilaria Maria Sala, a local journalist in Hong Kong, wrote about this. That almost inured people to, to realizing how horrific some of the things were. So I think the most important thing for the world to do is to keep paying attention, to not look away, and to see what's going on in Hong Kong as connected to some things that are very, very disturbing that are happening in Xinjiang, even more disturbing. And to see this as part of a pattern and to pay attention to it, bring it up. I think the UN, a uh, group of UN special rapporteurs have called for an investigation of Hong Kong uh, commission. I think that's the kind of thing, some kind of collective action by more than one country is what's important. Yeah. Joanna, you probably have some thoughts on this as well. Let me actually combine with one of the questions that may be up your alley here. Uh, <clears throat> one of the participants wrote in the Canadian Supreme Court ruling on Quebec regarding the legality of Quebec's secession under both Canadian and international law seems ap applicable to Hong Kong. Is there any possibility of a national referendum on self-determination in Hong Kong? Not likely, I would say. Particularly in view of China's clearly oppressive actions. Arguments made in the Kosovo independence case also seem applicable. Mm -hmm. so there you yeah, go. so maybe I'll answer the first question first, or at least add a little bit to it. Um, my sense is that there was a period when the law was first introduced in May and and yesterday when it was when it came into effect where countries around the world could have banded together and had a more concerted protest um, but on the most part I don't think that really happened I think UK and the US were among the most um, vocal um, in Canada our Prime Minister basically said Canada is really concerned we're very concerned about the 300,000 Canadians living in Hong Kong but Trudeau, um, his words were quite mild. He said he encouraged dialogue between the government and the stakeholders in, in Hong Kong. And um, I think the time for dialogue and Beijing reaching out that doesn't seem very like realistic. Um, when I was covering human rights and legal issues in Beijing for European media, there was a pattern where high profile arrests of um, civil society actors would happen on late on Friday night or it would happen during the week around Christmas when all the foreign correspondents were mostly home or we were drinking at the bar altogether. <laughs> so many times I would be rushing back to, from the bar uh, writing about these arrests. So I definitely think that there's a pattern and it, and it could be it could have been part of the calculus that um, Beijing pushed this law during a time when many countries are dealing with a pandemic. Um, that wouldn't be out of the ordinary when you look at the pattern of when they choose to do things. Like Jeff said, like there's often a pattern of being strategic and kind of waiting for a time when people aren't paying as much attention to incrementally take away rights or take actions. So in, in, a, in a way, it, it might be a little bit too late, um, but there are still some things that people tell me that they would like to see from their governments. So I can't endorse this myself as a journalist, but some of the things that's been mentioned, um, things like accepting asylum seekers. Um, about 50 at least asylum seekers are here in Canada already waiting for the asylum process. Um, but some people tell me that they're, they're hearing things from officials where they still believe or think that Hong Kong has a rule of law system and independent courts that could protect these asylum seekers. Um, 
and it's kind of up, up to question like whether countries will see the national security law as a pretty much undermining Hong Kong's independent legal system and whether more countries will consider accepting asylum seekers from Hong Kong. Of course, that's not like a great um, outcome because a lot of Hong Kongers love Hong Kong. They protested because of their love for the city. So having to escape like many have to Taiwan and such is, isn't something that's very happy for them. Um, as far as a referendum, I think there was um, grassroots efforts among Hong Kongers to, to poll people on whether they support universal suffrage. Um, and a majority said they did. Of course, this wasn't recognized at all by officials. So I don't think um, there will be that much appetite by authorities in Hong Kong to have dialogue. In the past, like just a few years ago, uh, Chief Executive Carrie Lam did meet with student leaders. Um, it was televised, they sat across each other at a table. It looks a lot different now. The mood has become a lot more polarized and a lot more antagonistic. So of course, like Jeff said, things might change. Hong Kong is unpredictable, but right now I don't see it. A really good possibility of things kind of being resolved through consultations and dialogue. Let me uh, take one question here, uh, which is relevant to what we we're just talking about uh, before I ask each of you to uh, tell us if the one country, two systems is over for good. Um, so uh, one of our uh, participants says, what is our government's current reaction? I assume by our government, uh, she means US, uh, current reaction to these changes in Hong Kong and are we being helpful at all? And of course, it, as you probably know, as most of our viewers probably know, the US has announced that we will uh, stop exporting high technology products to Hong Kong beyond what we already can export to China. Hong Kong, of course, had a special um, uh, regime where they could get much higher technology products from the US than China could, and we've changed that officially. Um, is that a smart policy? Are there other things that the United States should be doing? So I think, uh, as Joanna was saying, accepting uh, refugees, asylum seekers, would be one um, pragmatic thing. I think talking about it in high profile ways is something that people within Hong Kong want to see happen. Um, it's also important how we respond in the sense that um, even if it's too late and one of the questioners, uh, I just saw the question was saying, isn't it kind of too late? She's not gonna back down. I don't think she is going to back down um, Xi Jinping on Hong Kong. I don't think it's a matter of that, but I think exacting a price for this kind of move is something that could at least deter future actions like this and actions like, I mean, Taiwan is a place that people are very concerned about or worried about in um, Beijing. There are things that could be talked about at least. There could be talking about um, as much because of Xinjiang or more because of Xinjiang than about Hong Kong of mm -hmm. the 2022 Winter Olympics are scheduled uh, for Beijing um, and if heads of state don't go, that would be a sign of uh, displeasure, of pushback. Uh, so it's not whether this is something you should do, but I'm kind of surprised there isn't more, there's only a little bit of discussion of that. Whereas I think if this had come up before 2008, there would be a lot of it. And I think there's awareness in Beijing of that as well as of the distraction with the pandemic. Um, the other thing is just that um, the US government, if it would, do its messaging more consistently, which is a lot to ask. Um, Donald Trump at different points in the fall would criticize and uh, into this year combines criticizing China and criticizing China as something that can spur up nationalist sentiments within China uh, as against the West with praise for Xi Jinping. He said in the fall, he was confident Xi Jinping was a good leader and he resolved things in Hong Kong. That was so the wrong thing uh, to say. It feeds into the kind of strongman cult of Xi Jinping within China, while at the same time providing uh, grist for nationalistic propaganda saying, see, the West is wanting to interfere. The West is trying to keep China down. So I think really being quite specific about this is criticizing um, Xi Jinping's government, that we can't be praising Xi Jinping as a good leader at the same time we're criticizing these policies. So at least there's discussion and it's um, bipartisan to some extent about Hong Kong. Uh, but I agree with Joanna that in some ways the moment was a little bit earlier and the moment for the US 
was a lot earlier to develop better alliances and not ravage our alliances to be in a position when if we cared about something like this, we could rally um, a variety of countries to the cause. Yeah, and I would just, I can, um, just add, a, add a comment um, of my own on, on my own question. I, I actually worked on export controls quite extensively when I was in Hong Kong. I think it's, it's a wrong-headed policy. If we want to put pressure on China over what it's doing to Hong Kong, hurting Hong Kong like that is not the way to do it. We need to, to put pressure on China directly. Um, we're, we're pretty much out of time. I want to ask uh, both of you to comment briefly. Jeff, you already, I think, got, actually both of you have got into this a little bit about um, what do we think is happening. And we have actually one question related to this uh, from the uh, participants, which is, what is the economic future of Hong Kong? Will Hong Kong lose its importance to China's economy? And then, as I said, uh, do we think one country, two systems uh, is, uh, is realistic going forward? So whoever would like to take, uh, take that up briefly. Yeah, um, for on the economic side, I did speak with an economist who said um, some of the U.S. sanctions that's been floated will most likely disproportionately impact Hong Kong businesses and business multinational companies based in Hong Kong, including banks, rather than Beijing itself. Um, it's different. Like Hong Kong used to be like the engine of where business had to happen between China and the West, um, but now um, Beijing has uh, really promoted other economic hubs in Shanghai, Shenzhen, like ports are opening up all over the mainland coast. So it's not as dependent on Hong Kong as it was in the past. Um, so, and Hong Kong has gone through a lot, like with the pandemic, with the protests, the economy has been taking a hit. Um, and if there's anything else I'd like to add is that um, some of what Donald Trump has said and some other outspoken people have inadvertently also pushed um, kind of xenophobia against Chinese people or Asian people in general, um, which I don't think is helpful because countries might be reluctant to be more critical because they want to avoid alienating or further marginalizing um, minority groups. So I think any solution or any conversation should really consciously um, involve people up in the Hong Kong diaspora, people from Hong Kong. Um, and we've seen a little bit of that starting with a uh, new inter-parliamentary alliance on China, IPAC, and some other type of government-to-government -government efforts that don't rely on the U.S. to be kind of the moral leader, because I think some countries, some politicians tell me that there's a perception that Right now, the U.S. is not really seen as a very credible leader for democratic countries. So there's a little bit of a slow push towards building a multilateral um, network that don't rely on the U.S. and whatever Trump decides to say on any given day. Okay, thanks. Jeff, maybe a last few words on one country, two systems? Yeah, no, I thought that was, that was very beautifully said. I, I think one country, two systems as an ideal is really... Um, is a dead letter at this point that all that's left. And Xi Jinping and others have said what their model is Macau as one country, two systems is also mm -hmm. supposed to function there. And Macau has been largely politically um, compliant, but has a different way of making and spending money with the uh, um, casinos. And I think this is the model that Beijing would like to see for Hong Kong being economically somewhat different uh, but politically much less so. And even Macau, which, you know, was, um, you know, it was not politically troublesome, but it would hold a photographic exhibit um, around the time of the June 4th anniversary showing images banned in Beijing. And this year that was banned. Uh, there have been smaller vigils on June 4th to commemorate 1989 in Macau, big ones in Hong Kong. This year, um, permission to hold both vigils were turned down. So what we are seeing and I think this is the big, big picture to be aware of is uh, under Xi Jinping, Beijing's view is of a country with less variation among it. The country that in which he's emphasizing unified, as much unified control as possible with a little bit of difference allowed. Um, but it's, it's part of a, a, of a disturbing trend uh, countrywide. And I think we need to think about it that way when we think about, um, about Xi Jinping and think about it as criticism of a particular vision of China by the Chinese Communist Party, not as a criticism of Chinese people, not even as a criticism of China, because China can be different things at different points. Hong Kong um, 
my favorite website of uh, sort of uh, translations and uh, scholarship on China is called China Heritage. And it runs an ongoing series on Hong Kong called The Best China. That Hong Kong, in a sense, stands for something that Chinese culture, it's totally, it can be a different version of Chinese culture, of Chinese culture that's open to experimentation, open to creativity, not defined uh, by Beijing's rigidities. Interesting. Macau is, uh, is actually a sort of a, a literal metaphor for a vision of these special administrative regions as a cash cow for, uh, for China. Very, very interesting. Uh, well, thank you both uh, very much. I, I've learned a lot. I hope our, our participants have as well. And I want to thank you both for sharing your expertise and your time with us. Um, and I want to thank all of our members and guests for who, who uh, have joined the call. We'll continue to have more great programming over the coming weeks. I encourage you to join us on Tuesday, July 7th for a webcast with Jessica Yellen on disinformation in the age of social media. You can learn about all of the upcoming programs on our website, pacificcouncil.org. So with that, I thank you all very much. Thanks. Bye.